Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Gemology for Schmucks. My name is Peter Nelson, and I'm here to guide you in everything you need to know about gemstones. Now, what I have right here is a rather hefty but very small stack compared to some people of gemological books. And many of you wise and wonderful people have been asking me what book should I read if I want to study up on gemology, but I can't go to a gemological school. Well, I'm here to tell you that today. And this is not just for people who can't go to gemological school. This is really for everybody. If you want to know about gemstones, if you've gone to a gemological program and graduated, you should still be reading about these things. Because as I said in my last video about gemological schools, how do you choose the right one for you? Should you go or should you not? I said that continued learning is really something that everybody needs to be doing. Because a gemological program, if you become an accredited gemologist, or if you become a graduate gemologist, or a fellow of the Gem Association, or any of the other gemology programs, that's really just a foundation from which to begin. And then you need to continue learning. You will know how to identify stones and be aware of the general treatments, but new treatments are coming out all the time. Even new stones are being discovered. The main thing that's being taught in most gemological programs is how to test the stones using modern gemological equipment and to know using numbers and actual facts what the gemstone is and hopefully some of the common treatments as well. So if you truly want to know more about gemstones, you really need to read up on them and you need to attend seminars on experts who are talking about those stones. Some people devote their entire career to one type of gemstone. It's quite common for a career lab gemologist to do that. Some brokers who are more on the trade side will only sell one type of stone, maybe even from one geographic origin. And that allows them to get very specialized, to be aware of what is this stone and its properties, what treatments are common with it, what are the colors, what are the prices, all of that. For a lab gemologist, it's the same thing on treatments and colors and all of that, but they have different types of information to back them up. And they may be less aware of what's going on in the supply chain. It depends on how well they keep up on these things. Some people are reclusive, some people are social butterflies. There's a place for everybody. But anyhow, back to the point. What I'd like to tell you about is some of the ways that you can continue learning, how do you go about finding them, and what might they cost. So I'd like to divide your reading material into two basic groups. You've got reference materials, and you've got what I like to call coffee table books. Now both of these are important, but not necessarily everybody will buy all of them. There's some people that are just bibliophiles that will collect and collect and collect books, and they can line much larger than my office with books based on gemology and jewelry. It's not unheard of. But one thing we need to get out here up front is that information is not cheap and gemological books are some of the more expensive that you will find in your lifetime. I find that's true in a lot of technical fields though. If you look at books on metallurgy or medical books or any of the books that you bought in university, chances are they were a few hundred dollars. And that is not something that is uncommon in gemstone books. Now a small, you know, everyday, you know, you buy this on Amazon kind of book, Gemstones, that gives you cursory information about a great variety of gemstones. These are cheap, yes. For those of you who are multilingual, I definitely suggest getting some of these books about gemstones and jewelry in other languages. Because while you may be a competent speaker of that language, in my case Chinese, that doesn't mean that you have the technical vocabulary about that topic. So I bought this one, nice and small, in Guangzhou a number of years ago, and just reading through it gives me an exposure to the vocabulary used about gemstones. Now still, everyday laymen or the lao baixing are not going to know these terms, so you need to learn how to talk about them, otherwise you're going to bore everyone to death. So multilinguals definitely do check out some books, even if it's information you already know. Learning how to explain it in your second, third, fourth, fifth, etc. languages is an important skill, especially if you're in the sales side. So, these small books aside, what's up with all the big books? Now, this is a book on pearls that I just recently got by Elizabeth Strack. And as you can see, this ain't small. Now, fortunately, this one's on sale right now, but originally it's something like a 120 euro, I want to say. But if you're interested in pearls, this is one of the books that everybody seems to recommend. It's got gemology, it's got history, it's got in-depth information about the mollusks that form pearls, all the things. Now, this is the first category of book that I like to call reference materials. These are the kinds of books that you need as a gemologist to help understand and explain what's going on with the gemstones, 
Why is this gemstone rare? How did this treatment come about? If you don't understand about the formation of the gemstone, whether it's a biogenic gemstone like pearl or a crystalline gemstone like ruby and sapphire, if you don't understand how they are formed, then you're not going to understand the treatment processes because most of the time treatment processes are in fact a replica of what happens in the earth, just done in a laboratory condition. And each of those has those traces. Learning how to notice those traces is what's important. Natural processes leave certain types of traces that can be tested, sometimes with advanced machines, sometimes with something as simple as a microscope. And that's what we're looking for as gemologists. So reference books are very important for somebody who wants to actually understand the gemstone and who is interested in knowing how are the stones treated, are they synthetic or not, and keeping up on that information as it develops. Now while there are constantly new treatments coming out all the time, we're not necessarily talking about every day. There's going to be a new shell shocker that comes along every 15 years or so, or at least that's what it's looked like. And as long as you stay abreast of the current news, both through reading reference books like these and also the new papers that are put out by research labs and researching gemologists, then you can have a great deal of confidence in buying that material. And that's what you need if you're going to be a top level professional gemologist and not hack. This is dry. This is going to be something that not everybody needs to know and not everybody wants to know. If you just want to buy and sell certain stones, you can really just go to certain people, listen to their stories, and learn how to buy through that process. This is more for people who want that in-depth knowledge, who like the surety of the know-how. So if you want to have an intimate understanding of gemstones, you need reference books like this. And most of the time, they're on individual gemstones. So this is about pearls, it's about cultured and natural pearls. It's got a lot of information and it's not the only book. So you really need to get recommendations on certain stones that you are interested in. Not everybody deals in everything. If you're interested in pearls, I suggest this one. There are a few others that are also worth your time, but as far as a reference book, this is the one that I've heard the most. If you are interested in corundum, that's ruby and sapphire, then there is one book that you absolutely need to have. There are two versions of it, so please do pay attention. And that's put out by the research gemologist Richard Hughes and Coterie. He and his team are the ones that run Lotus Gemology, and this book is the one that you absolutely need if you want to understand corundum. It's got gemology, it's got history, it's got a whole lot, but there are two versions in the most recent edition. There is the Connoisseur's Guide, I believe it's called, or Collector's Guide, and that's about this thick. And then you've also got the Gemologist Guide, which is about this thick, which has in-depth information on the gemology of corundum, and it also has another half of the book about origins. And that goes step by step through most of the origins that are known these days, common features in those stones, some of the stories about those locations, and a little bit of the history of the deposit. It's a hefty book with a hefty price tag, but I promise you, this book is cheaper than one carat of an even okay piece of corundum. So if you actually want to understand corundum and not just sling them around based on certificates like <coughs> diamonds, then Ruby and Sapphire, a gemologist guide, is definitely something I suggest for you. If you want more cursory knowledge, then please by all means go for the connoisseur's guide, it can be quite dry. But all these reference books are dry. What are you talking about? Though maybe it's not fair to say it's dry, because as far as a reference book goes, it's infused with a lot of rather poetic language, and I'm really impressed by the author in general. Enough fangirling, Peter. Move on. Now, I've said coffee table books a couple of times, and coffee table books can also be quite expensive. But the difference, in my opinion, between a reference book and a coffee table book is that coffee table books oftentimes have a lot of great photography and they tell you a lot of stories about gemstones in general maybe something about the history of the deposits where these stones come from how those stones have involved themselves in the cultures that have loved those stones but they don't really tell you a whole lot about gemology and how to buy and sell them they're a wonderful thing to have there on the table or in your office if you are a gemstone person whether you're in retail or whether you're a jeweler or whether you're i don't know whatever it is you do but if you have these around, these are nice to look at, they're pleasant, and they don't make you feel bogged down, and they don't make your head hurt. That's a coffee table book. But at the same time, if I have a question about this stone and I'm trying to break a problem that I see, something that's perhaps awry with a stone that I'm looking at, I'm not going to go to these coffee table books for answers. I'm gonna to go to the reference book. Because now that I have the question about this stone, I can go back to the reference book and there might be a new door that's unlocked by this key. Because as the wisest of five-year-olds will say, you don't know what you don't know. And oftentimes it's looking at a stone and seeing something being off that puts that question in your mind and makes you go and seek out the answer. That's what the reference books are for. And of course also wise gemologists that have come before us and that have decades of experience also seek out those people when you have a good question. Otherwise, try and read the book first. So should you have coffee table books? Yes, especially if you're involved in sales. The coffee table books oftentimes are 
heavily infused with stories that you will need to bring back the romance into something that can be a very dry field. Gemology is wonderfully fascinating, but it takes the eyes of a child to see that fascination with the mysteries of the world. Otherwise, it's just cold, dry science. Even those of us that do enjoy a certain amount of cold, dry science also need to come back to the passion of the story. What drove people to this beauty from the earliest of days. And that's what coffee table books can do. Now, when you have those stories in your mind, because you've been perusing these coffee table books as they sit on your coffee table, the next time that you're talking to your clients or potential clients, you can pull these stories out or tidbits of them to spark their desire. And this is not about manipulation or beguiling or anything like that. It's really reintroducing people to the interest of our world. And that's the value of stories. While I'm still on the topic of reference books, there is one series of books that I've mentioned a number of times that serious gemologists do need to look at. And if you don't wanna have a huge selection of gemstones, then this is a great investment. I say investment because of two reasons. It ain't cheap, but it does provide a lot of information that you would only be able to acquire if you spent a lot of money on gemstones. And that is The Photo Atlas of Gemstones. This is a book that I believe is co-authored by Dr. Gubelin and John Koivula of GIA. And Mr. Koivula spent a long time photographing inclusions inside of gemstones. And so you have, I believe it's three volumes that are about this thick, full of pictures. And those pictures are incredibly high magnification pictures, really crisp about inclusion scenes in gemstones. And this is something that's very important if you're looking at stones to understand their treatments or their origin. Do you want to know if it's natural or synthetic? If you are not familiar with the inclusion scenes, you will never really no. Now in research labs, most of the time they will use advanced machines to also check and support their origin determination, but it always goes back to the microscope. They have to support what they see with their eyes and also what they see on the graph. Sometimes the chemical composition and the physical characteristics of the gemstone overlap a lot between origins. And that goes back to how our planet was actually created. Where were the boundaries of different lands way back when gemstones were being formed? And without getting into that a whole lot, because that's the area of research gemologists and field gemologists, I will just say that if you want to understand all of that, you need to dig more. But getting comfortable with the inclusion scenes is a great step along the way and it's nowhere near as dry because I promise you one of the most amazing things you will do in your life is take gemstones and take a microscope and actually get inside. Sometimes it absolutely blows me away that you can have something that's maybe a centimeter in size and that's a pretty big gemstone. And when you zoom in on it, you see the expanse of space. It's so bizarre to me how you can look inside something so tiny and see something so huge. And that's not just because of magnification but it really does reflect what you would see if you went out into outer space. Don't believe me? Try it, especially with garnets and spinel. Okay, sapphire too, and emeralds. There's a lot. So the photo atlas of gemstone inclusions is an incredible resource for anybody who really wants to get to know gemstones and who may only be armed with a loop. Having a microscope is a fantastic thing. If you don't have one, that's okay. Once you get used to those inclusion scenes, having a loop will be enough to give you a clue when you're out buying, whether you're in the bush, whether you're in the market, or in the comfort of your own office with a cup of coffee. Got the shakes. Another indispensable resource for anybody who's interested in keeping up on the science and development of science in gemology are magazines like In Color. In Color is a periodical put out by the ICA, which is the International Colored Stone Gemstone Association, and oftentimes there is a theme to each edition. So this issue is obviously about emeralds, this one's about Paraiba tourmaline, this one's about opals, etc, etc, and this is backlogged going back quite some time. Don't ask me how long. In Color is a great periodical if you want to keep up both on the stories and on the developing gemology of a given gemstone. Keep an eye out for those. The GIA also has its own newsletter and its own similar periodical that they put out, as well as a number of other gem associations. So do look out for these types of periodicals that are put out by gemstone associations. Some of them are free, some of them are paid subscriptions, but there's a lot of great value in them. And if you really just want something free, then do go on YouTube and check out not only my channel, because you're already here, <laughs> but also check out the GIA's channel. The GIA has a huge research department and they have some wonderful staff working for them. And they also put out a lot of free content on YouTube. They've got hour long lectures on a whole host of different topics. I'm not big on diamonds, so I skip those. 
But if you want to learn about pearls, if you want to learn about origin determination, emeralds, ruby and sapphire, whatever it is you want to learn about, especially in the major popular topics right now, they've been putting out hour-long discussions on these things by some of their top gemologists. So do go check out their channel. It's free. What do you have to lose? And of course, gemstones are not limited just to the gemological books and the coffee table books, but there's also technical manuals. So if you're interested in gem cutting, you can go over and get Justin Prim's 50 gemstone designs. It's got in-depth information on how to cut the 50 most common gemstone designs used commonly in the trade, as well as history and backstory of what it's like to be a lapidary way back in the day, reaching back centuries. Worth your time. If you know nothing about gemstone cutting, but you're interested in gemstones, then checking out Herbst's book on amateur gem fasting is also worthwhile. They've got two books, <gasps> and these are quite affordable and available on Amazon. So if you're looking to start your lapidary journey, those are the three books that I hear are most important. These give you the technical information that you need to get started, but of course there's no replacement for actually taking a course on gem cutting. But if you wanna get a taste before you decide, okay, am I gonna buy a machine or am I not? then these are the books that I would recommend to you. All right, I've blathered on and on about books. So if there's a specific gemstone that you are interested in, you're going to want to seek out the book for that stone. And if it's not written yet, well, maybe that's the universe telling you that it's your thing to write. Anyhow, if you got a comment, leave it down below. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Tell all of your friends about me, and until next time, bye bye